This presentation was recorded at the Best Practices for Pollinators Summit. For more information, contact pollinatorfriendly.org. So I'm going to talk briefly about and define what, what are native bee specialists and talk about their threats and how we can conserve some of these species. And then for most of the presentation, I want to highlight some native host plants. I know some of you are tuning in from all parts of the continent. The uh, information I'm presenting today is uh, talking about facts and figures for the central US, but I have um, some resources and links, uh, including Jared Fowler's website, which will have information for both the Eastern and Western US as well. But many and most of the plants I'm highlighting today will be native to both the Central and Eastern US and parts of the Western US. So I'm gonna talk about what is a native bee specialist and the advantages and disadvantages of being a native bee specialist some of the really cool pollen collection adaptations that these females have to collect their specific pollen from their specific plant. And as I mentioned, then I'm gonna walk us through an entire growing season starting in early spring and highlighting many of the native host plants that support these bee specialists. Some, some of these bee specialists will be quite rare, but others uh, will come to a garden if you plant these specific native host plants. And then I'll end off, hopefully, if I have enough time with a few resources, but as I mentioned and Lori just stated, there are links and additional resources on the Pollinator Friendly website. So as most of you probably already know, bees are considered vegetarian, having a completely plant-based diet. They are related to predatory nest building wasps. The wasps are their ancestors and these wasps hunt uh, various types of insects or spiders and then put those prey inside of the nest for their larvae to consume. Bees uh, branched off from their wasp ancestors with the radiation of flowering plants and have found that they can get all of their diet and nutrient needs from the floral resources provided by flowering plants. And that includes, of course, the pollen that flowering plants produce and in addition to the nectar. Pollen really is the most important floral resource as far as a bee larva's diet because it's really the meat of part of a diet. It contains the proteins and the lipids or fats, as well as amino acids, uh, various types of vitamins and minerals. And the nectar is really a, a combination of different types of sugars. So I call that sort of the gasoline for native bees. It's their fuel to do these activities such as nest um, building, looking for flowering plants and maybe looking for a mate. And here's a picture inside of a nest. So typically most female native bees are combining the pollen that they collect with uh, either some nectar or in rare cases, some floral oils. And, but the, as I said, pollen is the most important component of that bee larva's diet. This is a look inside of an orchard mason bee nest and you can see the three larvae that are propped up and busy consuming that combination of pollen and nectar. But in fact, it's uh, the bacteria and fungi that gets introduced into the provisions, uh, either from the pollen or through regurgitation of the fe female mother regurgitating the nectar. And it's those uh, microorganisms that are helping to facilitate the fermentation of the provisions and making it uh, more palatable for the bee larvae. So I'm gonna highlight these bees that are considered pollen specialists. And pollen specialists are really uh, a small subset of bee species where the females just collect pollen from 
uh, some sort of range of plants. And I'm going to go backward on this graphic, starting with uh, polylectic bees. So polylectic bees are the uh, not considered specialists. Uh, they have unspecialized pollen collection. And that means a single female bee species is collecting pollen from more than four plant families. So our social bees, such as the uh, bumblebees, for example, that have a season long colony, they are collecting flowering or pollen from flowering from a wide range of flowering plants. You can see even on that picture that I included of the two spotted worker, even on that pollen load that she has in her pollen basket, two different types of pollen based on the two colors that you can see on her hind leg. So specialization really varies by region. In the Eastern US, uh, approximately 75% of bee species are polylectic or not pollen specialist. Uh, Central US, 70%. And then as we get into the Western US, 65% of bee species are um, not specialists. So if we look at that in reverse, Eastern US have uh, on average 25% of native bee species that are specialists. Likewise, here in the central US, around 30%, but it varies by state. And of course, if you are uh, not a specialist, there are some other things that will influence whether a bee may visit a flower. So native bees come in all different sizes and they have different tongue lengths. So that alone, uh, the flower form you can see in these pictures I have included on the slide, a narrow flower form may restrict a really large bee from entering and gaining access. And uh, a complex flower form, such as that blue lobelia that the bumblebee is manipulating, uh, that will limit the types of bees that can access those resources simply because that flower needs uh, manipulation. And then, of course, the seasonal activity. As I just mentioned, bumblebees and our social bees tend to be active throughout the growing season because they have a social nest that are producing many offspring. But for the 90% or so of solitary bees, they have a fairly narrow window of time that they uh, are actively foraging on flowering plants and, and doing their nest building. So that Dunning's mining bee, for example, is a type of uh, mining ground nesting bee that is active in May. So the females would only be overlapping with flowering plants that are blooming in May. So that limits their types of pollens that they would collect. And similarly, as I mentioned, the tongue length, physical size, et cetera, et cetera their ability or inability to manipulate a flower is all going to influence and sort of narrow down even for those non-specialist bees, which plants they may visit. OK, moving down the graphic here, or up the graphic, um, this is one of the most unusual specialists. They're called eclectic oligolectic bees. Uh, someone once said to me, you should put that on a t-shirt. That is such a cool term. Uh, and here is an example, the southern blueberry bee, which is common in the southeast, where uh, blue blueberries are abundant. And this bee is an eclectic egolectic, oligolectic, because the females collect pollen from two plant genera that belong to completely different plant families. So she specializes on blueberry pollen, in addition to red bud and lupin pollen, which belongs to the pea family, whereas the blueberries uh, belong to the Ericaceae family or the Heath family. So that's an example of an eclectic oligolectic, but there really aren't that many uh, here in North America. And then probably the most common category for these bee specialists is the oligolectic bee. And they are uh, solitary bees that are collecting pollen from a handful of plant genera that belong to the same plant family. So the example I have here is a spine soldier shouldered cellophane bee. And these females are active in uh, late summer and autumn because they specialize on collecting pollen from goldenrods and asters, so, uh, plants, plant genera that belong to the aster family. So she would be considered an uh, oligolectic bee. 
And then moving down or moving up again, narrow oligolectic is a bee species that is just collecting pollen from a single plant genus. So the example here is a short-haired dogwood mining bee and the females just collect pollen from cornus or the dogwood genus. All right, so if we break this down, uh, there are six bee families in North America, seven bee families worldwide. That seventh family occurs in Australia. So these are the six uh, bee families that occur in North America. And the Andrenidae family, which is the mining bee family, as you can see, uh, make up over 50% of all pollen specialists. And this is, these are stats for the central US. 21% belong to the Apidae family, which includes uh, our bumblebees and longhorn bees uh, and many other types of uh, the, the uh, southern blueberry bee that I just showed that's the eclectic oligolectic. The cellophane and yellow face bees in the Calidae family make up only 7% of specialists. And Halictidae are our sweat bee family, so only 19 species are specialists, so it's a fairly small uh, percentage for that family. And the Megachylidae are the leaf cutter bees and the, and the mason bees. So they make up 14% or 69 species. And then the very small family, the Melitidae family, uh, have 2% are specialists or 10 species, but that is almost all of the species that occur here in that family in, in central US. And I apologize, I didn't do the whole map of the US. And unfortunately, uh, for those tuning in from some of the Canadian provinces, don't have those statistics. But um, so I just wanted to showcase what is the central US. And I'm basing this uh, on Jared Fowler's work and website. So you, as you can see, it really varies across these states. Here in Minnesota, we have 90 species that are defined as specialists, and that is only 18% of the total number of bees. The reason that number is quite low is because we, uh, the recent, there's a recent study that's been published that has updated the number of bee species that occur here in Minnesota. It's 508, and I think it's even grown since then. So our number of percentage of specialists has actually decreased with that um, recent publication. And then you might imagine that some of the other states may be undersurveyed, and so some of these percentages and numbers may not be accurate. And um, re again, reinforcing that we need more uh, studies and surveys to find out where bees are occurring across the US and Canada. And here are some of the top plant genera that are supporting the most bee specialists in central US. The, the top of uh, all of it, as you can see, is the sun, sunflower genus Helianthus, uh, supporting over 101 specialist species. So some of those would be narrow specialists and some of them would be um, just oligolectic specialists. And as you can see, many of these plant genera on this graphic belong to the aster family, the asteraceae. So those open flower forms and easy to access pollen and nectar uh, are supporting a, a number of uh, specialists. And I'll be talking about many of these plant genera later in the presentation and highlighting one or two of the specialists that rely on these flowering plants. So how do specialists find their host plants? I think you could probably say this is still a bit of a mystery. Uh, one theory is they, the females, when they come out of the nest where they were reared, just remember they have never seen the world. They have never seen flowering plants before. So how do they know to find the specific plant that they need to collect pollen from? Well, one theory is that they're using olfactory means or uh, smell. So as they were larvae inside of that nest, can, sitting and consuming that pollen that the mother had provided, that pollen would have uh, floral odors and in addition, or the pollen would have odors uh, and pick up floral odors. And so as they were consuming that pollen, they were associating that smell with the host plant. 
Are they potentially using floral visual cues? That hasn't been determined. There was a 2008 study, and what they did is they attempted to rear females on uh, pollen that was not their host pollen. And th what happened is the females uh, ceased nesting activities. So the, the active females trying to build a nest were given non-host pollen, and they just said, nope, I'm throwing my bee arms up and I'm going away because this isn't working. But the males of the same species in this study were reared completely on non-host pollen and uh, developed into adulthood. And they still went out into the landscape and flew around and patrolled the host plants, uh, the pollen host plants. So still some mysteries to be uh, maybe determined how these specialists are finding their host plants. So some advantages of being a specialist, this is a, a, a Monarda or wild bergamot specialist pictured here. And the advantage of course is if the, the flowering plant that they're depending on uh, is in a good population and is in close proximity to where they are nesting, then uh, that's a real advantage. The floral constancy means that the bee is just visiting that flowering plant. So from the plant's perspective, uh, that could improve pollination because there's uh, not a variety of different pollens being contacted on that plant's stigma. And it can also, of course, for the bee, improve foraging efficiency. It takes out the guest work, guesswork. They, they know exactly where to go if they have a large patch of their host plant nearby. The advantages from the male bee perspective, and I just mentioned patrolling, uh, many male bees will either patrol nesting areas or they will patrol flowering plants to look for females to mate with. And so this makes uh, the male specialist bees lives perhaps quite easy because they just head on over to the host plant and hang out there and use it as a rendezvous site and then they wait there and look, wait for the females to come to the flowers. And so this is uh, one uh, fun thing that you can look for. You can see this uh, cellophane bee, Calides latitarsis male. He's just perching on the leaves of the, of the host plant, in this case, ground cherry. And so uh, you can sit and wait with your camera if you see this behavior and uh, wait with, along with the male for the female to come and visit the flower. The male on the right image is one that uh, the females specialize on collecting pollen from plants in the verbena genus. And there he is just propped up on the flower raceme or flower spike uh, on an unopened flower, just waiting for a female to come. And then, of course, the disadvantages, uh, it's a narrow diet, if, especially for those really narrow specialists. They're, the larvae are just consuming pollen for, from perhaps one plant genus or even one plant species. And similarly, that can put specialists at risk because with habitat loss, like landscape fragmentation, uh, climate change is a real concern for these specialists because of the mismatch of when the plant may flower versus when the uh, specialist bee emerges from its nest and begins nesting activities. So these are all real concerns going forward, of course, with our very altered landscape that we live in today. So here's some cool uh, um, examples of pollen collection adaptations that some specialist females have. I, I wish I had a photo of this, but I couldn't probably illustrate it well. <laughs> but uh, the ab abdominal drumming is uh, kind of, I guess you would call it a similar mechanism to uh, buzz pollination where some native bees have the ability to shake pollen from flowers. And this abdominal drumming by Osmia, which are bees in the mason bee genus, what they do is they collect pollen on the bottom of their abdomen. And this study found that they are rapidly patting the bottom of their abdomen on the uh, flower, pollen producing parts of the flower. And that is a really quick and easy way for them to basically 
pick up the pollen that they need in in short period of time. Similarly, these longhorn bees do abdominal tapping, so they're they don't collect pollen on the bottom of their abdomen. They have long, dense hairs on their hind legs, but they will sort of tap the end of their abdomen at uh, a, a lower frequency than the mason bees, and and then they're able to quickly brush the, the pollen collected onto their uh, pollen collecting hairs on their hind legs. Here's another example of a specialist pollen collecting specialist adaptation. This is the female that specializes on uh, plants in the genus verbena or the verveins. And here she is, it's hard, she's a very tiny bee in the genus Calliopsis. It's hard to see in this photo, but what she is doing is she's inserting her forelegs right into that flower corolla. And as you can see, ver this vervain has a fairly long flower cor corolla, but the anthers are sort of staggered inside and her forelegs are just long enough that she can rake out the pollen uh, that from the anther that is just inside that flower corolla. And she has these long curly bristles on her forelegs to do so. So the very different pollen collection strategy uh, for this tiny specialist bee. All right, now I'm going to walk us through the uh, entire growing season, hopefully get us uh, inspired for spring and thinking about things, uh, native plants to plant to host some of these specialists, and also really giving you some ideas for perhaps some of these aren't appropriate to grow in a garden, but you're doing larger scale restorations, and also just giving you a specific plant um, to understand that you can search for and observe and perhaps document some of these specialists that are reliant on these specific plants. So if we here in Minnesota fast forward here, uh, we're having a, a wild warm winter, but typically our native willows in the genus Salix are some of the first plants to bloom in the spring. You'll find many of the species growing in wetter areas along wetlands. We do have a prairie willow that is uh, found in drier sites. And our native willows have separate male and female plants. And this you can see if you look closely at the, the flowering part of the willow, the catkin, the female flowers have the stigmas and are producing nectar, and the male flowers are visibly producing pollen in addition to nectar. So even in sitting in a willow patch, uh, take note whether you're watching a male or female flower flowering plant, and that will influence uh, or what perhaps uh, different flower visiting insects, including the specialists. So I typically tend to sit and watch uh, in front of male plants more often than females because I'm looking for some of these specialists that collect the pollen. And in central US, there are 19 narrow oligoelectric specialists of, of willow. So that means the females are just collecting willow pollen. Two examples I have here on the side, slide. The one on the top, the colorful willow mining bee is her common name and she likes to nest in uh, compacted sand near willows. Moving on to perhaps walking through a woodland in early spring, some of the first uh, herbaceous plants begin to bloom and water leaf uh, plants in the hydrophyllum genus support one specialist, a type of mining bee, and that's pi her pictured there uh, in the genus Andrina. The bees in the genus Andrina tend to be about medium size, maybe honeybee size, but this particular species it's, is much smaller than many of her other related um, species. And you'll find her, again, it, you, this is really interesting looking at the, the foraging behavior. So if you were to watch a big queen bumblebee fly into this water leaf flower, um, she's gonna have a very different for, foraging behavior, probably seeking out nectar from this flowering plant. But then you have to look much more closely for this little tiny bee hanging out on the end of the flower stamen, uh, actively collecting pollen. So don't forget to look for the, the tiny things as you 
are looking for some of these specialists. Another uh, woodland in Savannah, uh, flowering plant in spring, the wild geranium in the genus geranium, sometimes called crane's bill, and it has one narrow oligolectic specialist, another type of mining bee. And I just love documenting these because geranium pollen has this large sort of clumpy sticky uh, pollen grains as you can see in the image. So they, uh, and the female there is actually chewing on the anther. I don't know whether she's actually consuming the pollen or trying to open up that anther so that she can uh, collect more pollen to take back to her nest. And then we're getting into later in spring, the golden Alexanders in the genus Zizia are common in uh, sunnier woodlands, uh, open savannas, even prairies. And this uh, flowering plant belongs to the carrot family. So it has that typical umble like flat, flat topped uh, flower head. And those individual florets are extremely shallow. And this is another type of mining bee in the genus Andrina. They're very, very tiny. So you have to look very closely and try to try and document um, this particular specialist. It is believed in addition to collecting zizia pollen that the females may also collect pollen from other genera that also belong to the carrot or APACA family. Uh, Flowering shrubs, uh, some of the native flowering shrubs also support specialists, including the dogwood, which I highlighted earlier. Here in the central US, there are four species that specialize on dogwood. So the females just collect dogwood pollen. The nice thing about our native dogwoods, uh, no matter where you live, we have a number of species to choose from. Uh, each has its own sort of specific habitat. And here in my own home landscape, I have uh, three species. And so they provide almost a staggered or a longer flowering period, which is sort of by design on my part. I'm hoping that uh, if, you know, with climate change and this particular specialist pictured here that does come to the dogwood in my yard, I'm at least providing that longer flowering phenology by planting a number of species within the genus that it specializes on. All right, summer. So these are, I'm going to highlight a couple of what I call oddball plants that are really not on many people's radar, but I want to mention them because they do support specialists. Uh, this plant is called ground cherry. It's in the same genus as tomatillos if you're growing those in your vegetable garden. And uh, ground cherries belong to the tomato and uh, eggplant family. And those flowering plants are nectarless and they also require buzz pollination. So we have six uh, bees that specialize on collecting physalis pollen. Uh, two pictured here. One is a cellophane bee, the Calides latitarsis, and then this really, really tiny fairy bee on the left in the genus Perdita. Uh, she likes to nest in loose, compacted sand and just collects physalis pollen, but she is so tiny, she's only going to be flying maybe a hundred yards or so to her patch of ground cherry or physalis. So you can see how limiting or specific her habitat may be. And if that small population of ground cherry is eliminated from, in this case, the sand prairie where I photographed her, um, then her ne the next generation will be uh, without the host plant. Purple prairie clovers in the genus Dahlia are just amazing. I just love getting, doing photography of any flowering visit, visiting insect on Dahlia because the Dahlia flowers have this bright orange um, oily pollen. And the bee pictured here, there are 17 specialists. This is one of them, Perdita purpolita. It's a type of fairy bee, very, very pale coloration. You are only going to find uh, her in uh, sand, high quality sand prairies because she likes to nest in sand. And of course, that's where her host plant, Dahlia, typically grow in, in well-drained sandy soils. Another um, Dahlia specialist, I just photographed this one for the first time last year in a high quality rest, uh, prairie restoration, but also sandy. And uh, taxonomists are still, still sorting out which genus it may belong to, but uh, it's a 
called the white clothed longhorn bee. It is rare and it is the females just collect pollen from prairie clovers. A third dahlia specialist is another type of, or a type of cellophane bee and uh, also nesting in sand. So these bees are occurring in the same habitat conditions as, as their host plant. So uh, you will find these cellophane bees in very high quality sandy, uh, either prairie, prairie sandy remnants or uh, high quality resort, restored sites where purple prairie clover grows. I just wanted to note the, I'm going to go backwards. These last, um, as you can see, there's a trend in some of these daily specialists that they're silvery and kind of white in color. And I purposefully picked this picture on the, on the right of the plant to show that that unopened cone on the silvery cone on the flower head of dahlia. Uh, I'm wondering, I'm wondering to myself as I'm photographing all these specialists that there isn't some design of camouflage for some of these species. Here is a fourth one uh, that also specializes on dahlia. You can see the silvery hairs, another species of cellophane bee, but she also will collect pollen from plants in the amorpha genus. So I've got lead plant pictured here. Lead plant also has that bright orange, very oily pollen that I would imagine is extremely nutritious for, for this specialist. So uh, very cool to have these silver, silver haired and pale colored uh, specialists of dahlia. And I've highlighted this uh, specialist er earlier for her really cool pollen collection adaptation, sticking her forelegs right into the flower opening of the verbena flower. And this is an uncommon to rare species that just collects pollen from plants in the verbena genus. Now, I'm, this is probably the most interesting uh, example of specialization. So we have native loose drife that belong to the genus Lysimachia. Many of our native Lysimachia have yellow flowers, so unrelated to the invasive purple loose drife. And they, we have a number of narrow specialists for here in the central US that not only collect just collect the flowers pollen, but they also collect the flowers oils that are produced. So these native loose drifts, uh, much like that ground cherry, are nectarless plants. But if you take a close up look of a native loose drift flower, what you will see is the, the parts of the flower, even the stamens have these glands, oil secreting glands. And we're looking at in this Im close up image of beads of oil that are sort of uh, collecting on the ends of small stalks. And these glands are also called trichomes. You'll find them on both the, the flower corolla in addition to the filaments. And so these pollen and oil collecting specialists, oh, here's an example, one in the genus Macropus. The, uh, again, a, another pollen collection adaptation or oil co collection adaptation. The females are collecting pollen on hairs on their hind leg, as you can see here in Joel's picture. But on their forelegs, they have oil uh, brushes. So talk about multitasking, can't tell in this picture. But she, with her forelegs, she's combing off those beads of oil from the flower. And then at the same time, she may be chewing a little bit on the anthers and that pollen starts to accumulate on the bottom of her abdomen. And then she transfers that pollen to her hind leg pollen collecting structures. So she's doing this <laughs> amazing multitasking to collect both of the floral oils and pollen in one flower visit. And then she will incorporate some of those floral oils right into the uh, provisions. And in some cases, use the floral oils to help waterproof the ground nest um, or the nest below ground. All right, uh, midsummer, the uh, plants in the Monarda genus, the bee balm are sometimes called bergamots, wild bergamot. This is Monarda fistulosa pictured here. 
And just thinking of that flower form, those long flower corollas, what do we typically see visiting Monarda? Well, that would be long tongue species, including our native bumblebees, in addition to a variety of different uh, butterflies and moss because they are able to access the flower's nectar. Now, again, another example of look a little closer because way out on the ends of these flower corollas, you will find uh, one of the specialists pictured here, the Deforia monarde, and these tiny black uh, bees in the sweat bee family will cling on to the end of those flower corollas and uh, start collecting the monarda's white pollen. So look a little closer, ignore those big bumblebees, even though they're fuzzy and charismatic, <laughs> and take a closer look for the little tiny ones. Native thistles. So thistles have had been given a bad rap for many, many years uh, because of the introduced non-native and often invasive species that are really problematic in agricultural situations. But we have native thistles and we have 31 different species of bees in the central U.S. alone that specialize on thistle and sometimes uh, thistle in addition to other pollens. This is the uh, pasture or field thistle pictured here. Now this is not maybe a plant for the home garden. It can get six to seven feet tall. It's biannual, but I can tell you, I planted it in my home garden. And of course it flowered in the second year being biannual. And even just doing that, um, the this particular specialist showed up where I had never seen it before and started collecting the pollen from thistle. Now Xerxes has a wonderful guide about uh, all of the different native thistles and how to grow them. And so I encourage you to check that out to learn more about which native thistles may be appropriate for a smaller home garden or if you're doing a larger scale restoration. The uh, Rudbeckia or the black and brown eyed Susans also support a pretty significant number of specialists, 33 in the central US. These are the ones I have pictured here are not by any means narrow oligolectics. They are what you would consider a legolectic specialist. So they're visiting uh, a handful of genera uh, that all belong to the same family Asteraceae. So uh, you'll find the Paranthidium jugatorium. It's a type of uh, bee in the leafcutter bee family. The females collect pollen on the bottom of their abdomen, so they love to do sort of a almost circular uh, pass around the pollen producing parts of around the cone of the flower. And then the protandrina uh, are very tiny bees in the mining bee family. And you'll often find that Rudbeckia is one of the first plants that they may be collecting pollen from, followed by uh, goldenrods and asters later in the uh, summer or early fall. Retibida is a very common plant included in uh, prairie restoration seed mixes. It can be dominant for several, for several years and a similar structure, a taller cone like central cone that's producing uh, disc florets that have both pollen and nectar. This is a uh, a narrow specialist, this mining bee pictured here. She she collects pollen from just Rutibida in addition to Rudbeckia. And uh, Rutibida supports uh, 15 different specialists in the central U.S. Ironweed, uh, Vernonia, beautiful. I think the just the flower color alone of ironweed is just amazing, sort of a royal purple that I can't think of another native flowering plant that has uh, a purple that's anywhere similar. And it supports 12 specialists, including this uh, longhorn bee that I have pictured here. And she is a narrow specialist. She'll collect uh, iron so ironweed, I want to say ironwood, ironweed pollen in addition to uh, sunflower pollen. If you're a vegetable gardener, there is uh, a, a handful of specialists uh, for all of the vine crops, including the ones in the genus Cucurbita, squash, pumpkin, melon. And this is the most common one here in north central U.S. in the northeast. The, the squash bee recently reclassified. It used to be in the Pepinapis genus. Now it's uh, Eucera. 
And if you look inside of uh, squash flowers that are just about to open, you may find a number of these squash bees just hanging out. They're likely going to be males because much like that um, it, thing I talked about earlier with males going to the host plant, well, the male squash bees practically live in the squash flowers. They go into ones that are about to open and they hang out there and then they wait for the females to come. And a study actually found that the males are better at pollinating the squash because they spend more time in the flower than, than the female does. The squash bees have very shallow nests in the ground and they will be excavating those nests in really close proximity to their host plants, in this case, the squash pumpkin and melon. And their nests can get impacted because their nests are very shallow, uh, five inches deep. So this is where uh, an agricultural field growing squash and pumpkin, and then they're tilling it after the crop is done in the fall. They could be tilling up the actual bee that's doing their crop pollination. Sunflower, as I talked about on that earlier graphic, is the hands down um, plant for supporting the most specialist, 101 species. This is one pictured here, uh, type of mining bee that is uh, a specialist of just helianthus or sunflower. Sunflowers are tricky for home landscapes because many, even though we have uh, many species to choose from, no matter where you live in, in North America, um, they tend to be rhizomatous and spread quickly. So just keep that in mind uh, if you're going to plan on planting a sunflower in a home landscape. Uh, they're typically better for larger restorations or larger properties. This is another uh, very rare specialist of helianthus in, in addition to other plants in the aster family. I photographed it for the first time last summer in a high quality sand prairie remnant. It's a, called Dionomia heteropoda and it's a very, very large bee and uh, the females or was, was visit, this female was visiting, I believe, Western sunflower in this sand prairie. So uh, look for not only the really tiny bees, but uh, that we do have some specialists that are extremely large in size. So here I just wanna highlight some, this is why rare habitat is so important. This is a photo from uh, Gray Cloud Scientific and Natural Area, which is uh, in the southeast part of the Twin Cities Metro. It's under threat from um, proposed development surrounding it. And it's an ancient dune and sand prairie remnant that hosts some really cool and rare plants, but also an abundance of uh, these flowering plants I've been highlighting that support specialists. And this one pictured here, the Dianthidium simile, has a really uh, cool uh, life history and also a very uh, narrow life history as far as its needs are concerned. So it will nest right in uh, loose sand, but it typically the females like to excavate their nests at the base of native bunch grasses. And the fibrous roots of those bunch grasses helped to provide the nest structure. But nest, as you know, if it's dry and friable, just kind of falls apart. So in addition to excavating their nests at the base of bunch grasses, the females will collect resin, typically pine sap from perhaps pine trees nearby, carry that resinous material back in their mandibles and then combine it with sand particles to help create better nest structure of their ground nest. They are also uh, narrow specialists of goldenrod and aster. Uh, I have males pictured here visiting uh, golden aster and, and genus heterotheca. But I just wanted to highlight how special some of these rare sites are and that we should do all that we can to uh, preserve them because they host these rare species. 
And now we've gone through the growing season and we're into early autumn or late summer. And this is when goldenrods and asters really begin to shine. And for even the home gardener with a quarter acre size lot, there are a number of well-behaved clump forming goldenrods that you can choose from. Just be sure to do your homework, uh, pick the species that's going to best match your conditions. This is gray goldenrod that likes sand. So if you have heavy clay soil, that would not be a good candidate, but I can assure you, you could, you should surely be able to find at least two to three goldenrod species that are will work in your home landscape. This is one of my favorite specialists and uh, Jared on his web website uh, says that they're uncommon. I find them fairly common here in Minnesota. The, the Her common name is hairy banded biny bee. I think she looks quite teddy bear like and I always love to see her it's a, for me it's a signal that fall is beginning so goldenrod supports 57 uh, pollen specialists and likewise the asters in the genus symphiotrichum and eurebia support 50 specialists so some narrow specialists some a little bit broader oligolectic specialist. This is a longhorn bee that is uh, basically an aster and goldenrod specialist. So she's collecting pollen from, oh, excuse me, just an aster specialist. <laughs> and some other aster specialists, uh, the one in the genus, uh, both in the genus Andrina or mining bees. And you'll find them uh, visiting both goldenrods and asters. So just like the goldenrod story I just told, <laughs> there are uh, so many asters to choose from. Make sure you're trying, I would recommend trying to grow at least three aster species in addition to your three goldenrod species. So that, again, you're thinking about the, the flowering phenology of these important pollen plants and lengthening that flowering phenology for, for some of these um, more common and specialists that will be coming to your garden. And lastly, I thought I'd tell a fun story about cuckoo bees. So cuckoo bees, if you're not aware of what they are, they are native bees, or in th this case, because that's what I'm talking about today, uh, that do not build their own nest, but they instead will sneak into the nest of another solitary bee and then lay their egg in a brood cell that is being prepared with provisions. And this is a type of cuckoo bee that's quite rare. I photographed it last summer in the same spot that I was photographing some of those rare pur purple prairie clover specialists. And uh, so it specializes on preying on just a dahlia specialist. So meaning that its offspring, its larvae is just consuming uh, dahlia pollen. So you can almost consider there's a double specialization here, the specializing on a host. And then they're also their larvae are specialized diet eating the specialist diet that the host has provided. So I just want to highlight how layers and layers of specialization. So as you can imagine, this, this particular cuckoo bee is quite rare. It's only going to occur where its host occurs and it's only the host will only occur where its host plant occurs. Similarly, another one in the genus Epiolus. This one is called the uh, bifasciatus, meaning the, the two bands on its abdomen. And it is a specializes on preying on the cellophane bee that specializes on ground cherry. So I, if I see some of these rare cuckoo bees, this one is much more common, commonly observed. So if I'm out photographing bees and I see this uh, particular cuckoo bee, it tells me that uh, it's highly likely that there is the host nesting within close proximity with due to its presence at the site. So you can, cuckoo bees can tell you a broader story once you learn uh, more about them. So what can you do to help support some of these specialists? Well, obviously, if, if at all possible, start incorporating some of these specialist plants into your landscape and your restorations. If you can't find them for sale, ask your local native plant grower to start growing some of, some of these specialist plants that you are unable to find. I can't emphasize enough how important it is for us to advocate for the protection of 
and, and restoration of this high quality habitat that is hosting these uh, pollen host, rare pollen host plants in addition to rare bee species, but also many of these high quality sites, of course, have diverse bee populations. So specialists and non-specialists alike. And get out your camera and start looking for and helping document some of these specialists. And you can do so by joining iNaturalist. I think that's the best platform for uh, bees, if you're into bee specialists. And as I mentioned earlier, Jared Fowler's information, he's, he's systematically cataloging and listing all of the specialist bees, their host plants, their occurrence by state. And he also has a host plant, so sort of the reverse of the specialist bee listing uh, website. And those uh, links Lori has included in the um, additional materials. You can also head on over to the National Wildlife Federation. Jared Fowler partnered with Doug Tallamy. So from a, a broader eco region view, they have uh, keystone host plants for bees. So it will include some of these pollen specialist plants, in addition to the plant species that host a high number of butterfly and moth caterpillars. So a different category of keystone plants. So I hope you enjoyed the presentation and learned a little bit more about some of these amazing common and rare pollen specialist bees. Thank you.